Hello everyone, how's it going? We're back again with another episode of AWS What's Next. Uh, Rob, thank you for joining us today. You know, two co-hosts back in the driver's seat here. Um, my name is Nick Walsh, developer advocate here at AWS. Uh, Rob, why don't you say a little bit about what you do? Yeah, I work with Nick on the developer advocacy team here at AWS, and we work together on projects like this one to bring exciting announcements across AWS to you. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is episode four. If you haven't been with us for the first three ep or episode three, four, I don't know. I've lost track. But um, if you're here for the first time, welcome. This is the show where we like to recap the latest and greatest launches here from Amazon Web Services. Uh, we know that there's lots of different ways that folks consume this information and these announcements. Uh, but I know personally, I enjoy getting to see it in video forms, in audio form, and it's a great supplement to the blog posts that are already out there. Uh, there's a lot to consume and it's easy to miss stuff, so we try to distill down some of the most important ones. Uh, again, a little opinionated here. We, we try and pick our favorites, but I know everyone has their own. Uh, and try to get that information to you in a slightly more engaging way. Uh, so we do things like uh, some demos that will be... I don't want to give too much away, but uh, Rob, I think it's worthwhile to tell them what, what they have in store for themselves later in the episode, right? Yeah, definitely. There's certainly some amount of editorialization. These are things that we find exciting, but we also try and make sure that there's a good variety of different announcements. So there's a little bit of every of content for everyone, no matter where you are in the tech stack. And of course, the the highlights of this show are the um, the special guests that we have from the product teams to talk in depth about the product. Yeah. So uh, we'll 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 lift the curtain a little bit for what you, what you have to look forward to. Uh, today we're going to be showing some demos from Deep Composer again the. Um, machine learning powered uh, instrument with the service that sort of backs that uh, you know, through the AWS console uh, and AppFlow as well, uh, which I'm also very excited about. I know that launched very, very recently. Um, I won't go too much into describing that one because there's a lot to talk about in that session. Um, but again, you know, we're going to go for about uh, an hour, an hour and a half, depending on how each long each of those demos goes. Um, before we get into the first one, we're going to start with, you know, how we usually start the show, which is Rob and I, how we've, we've handpicked a, hand, uh, a bunch of different launches that we found really exciting. We know customers have, have uh, told us that they find really exciting. And so we wanted to cover a bit of those. Um, all the while, again, this is a live show. So we're streaming directly to twitch.tv slash AWS. Um, I think that's the only outlet we have for this week. So if you are in chat, get questions or comments forwarded along in there. And we'd love to be able to get those asked um, either to each other here on the broadcast or to the um, the service teams that are, that are giving the demos a little bit later on in the session. Uh, so please don't be shy. Get those comments in. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, while we might not be able to answer every question that you ask, we, we are well positioned to find the right person who can give you those answers. So uh, whatever those thoughts are, even if you just want to have a discussion in chat, definitely encourage that. OK, wonderful. We also will have a uh, survey at the end of the broadcast for getting feedback. You know, what did you like? What didn't you like? And anything in between. Uh, we'll be posting the link in chat again at twitch.tv slash AWS. Uh, and if you needed a little bit more of an incentive, everyone who fills out the survey uh, or the first 100 respondents to the survey will be getting a $10 promotional code for AWS uh, as a thank you for your service. Um, but without that, any other housekeeping things that I forgot, Rob? No, I think we're ready to jump into the news segment. Okay, awesome. Put my uh, my little newscaster hat on. I, I don't even know why I said that because newscasters don't wear hats, but <laughs> yeah. it's raining outside here in New York, so I, I guess we can pretend for today. Yeah, yeah. So um, for our news, we have, as Nick said, a couple of these announcements, and we're just going to go into a little bit more detail, break it down for you, and then you can also see some of these uh, links uh, referring to uh, the topics we're covering. Um, people will be posting those in chat. Um, well, first up, we have a feature for uh, GameLift, um, Amazon GameLift called Fleet IQ. Now, this takes a little bit of explanation. You know, this is Twitch after all. You're probably here uh, because you're a gamer. And, uh, you know, games are awesome. Nick and I are, are huge gamers. And uh, this is especially cool feature for us because it's something that, you know, we relate to as game developers. Um, so with GameLift, uh, what you can do, let's talk about the GameLift feature first, and then we'll talk about the incremental feature of Fleet IQ on top of GameLift. Uh, what GameLift can do is basically help you manage your fleet of game servers. So we're talking about session-based server-side games. Um, any game where you have a, a server, you know, you think like a, um, a, a CS server or a Quake server, um, you know, you're running this server, you have a session, you have a couple of players joining for a match, and then the session ends, right? As opposed to, let's say, a game with 
that is not session based like an MMO like World of Warcraft is not session based it runs constantly right so the specific use case here is that you're talking about session based games they have a finite start time and a finite end time and during that time there's a group of players and usually that's a pretty exclusive group of players sometimes players can join and leave but um, usually it's the same group of players that stays on through the session more or less um, and you play for that one session and then the game ends so for these kinds of games, um, we we basically built a, a product within Game Tech called GameLift that allows you to manage your EC2 fleets. Um, so what this can do is you basically define the binaries that will run your game server, and it'll handle the deployment to EC2, uh, your virtual machine instances, and it'll manage kind of like spinning them up, spinning them down, and then making sure that your costs are optimized over time. That way you're not keeping, let's say, a fleet of 100 servers even though you only need, let's say, uh, 20 servers during off-peak hours, right? Um, and that can add up. The costs of running a fleet like that can add up over time. Now, one of the things that customers have, have done with AWS almost since the beginning of EC2 is uh, inquire about ways to save costs. And one of the ways that they do this is by using spot instances. Now, for those of you who are familiar with spot instances, uh, you know that it's a way that can help you save up to 90% um, of your costs because spot instances are actually standby instances that are not being used for active capacity. So there's a bidding system in terms of like, you say, I want to bid this amount, so I want to get this spot instance at this price. Now, of course, the trade-off with spot instances is that they can be interrupted. So while you're running your workload on your spot instance, you, uh, you get this interruption warning, and basically the instance can be taken away from you after two minutes of use. And so your application has to be able to handle a graceful shutdown if it's successfully run on a spot instance. Now, this proposed, this causes a, um, a challenge when you're building game servers because if you're running a game server session on a spot instance and you get this interruption, then the server will be taken away and the game session is going to shut down and that's going to create a really bad player experience. So the specific feature we have here with Fleet IQ for game lift is that we can actually thread these requirements and we can have a sweet spot in terms of the trade-offs of having the cost savings as well as the reliable uptime. And so what the game lift team has done is that by combining, by creating a fleet that is a hybrid of on-demand instances and spot instances, they can actually provide a way to use these, the spot instances, give you significant cost savings and experience an interruption rate of about one in 50,000 sessions. That's pretty incredible. I venture a guess that you know your game server probably crashes for networking errors or programming errors more frequently than one in 50,000, right? Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Did you, did you yeah, I was. I was just gonna say, you know, like in the grand scheme of, of you know, like trying to make uh, your game as performant as possible and to reduce sort of the blast radius. Uh, I know a lot of customers uh, when they when they think about the cost savings for Spot, it's something that's super enticing. But managing sort of the instances that may be possible to run your your game on, or managing this interruption in the past, uh, or minimizing it as much as possible, has been a large concern. And Fleet IQ is essentially purpose built for these sessionized game scenarios. Um, you know, like this is again not necessarily just a general purpose sort of implementation for all EC2 spot instances, but instead is specifically designed to be optimized for, for game servers. So something that I think sort of becomes a no-brainer, right? Like if you're looking to save save money or, or to increase your capacity for spiky workloads where you don't want to have them all be on demand, uh, Fleet IQ is, is a really good value add here in the game lift offering. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, the, the, the way you might wonder, how do they do this? Because there must be some magic going on. How can they procure these instances and then not have them uh, terminated in time? And it's actually a combination of two things. One is that it uses a, um, uh, a trained machine learning model. Uh, and it makes, basically makes predictions about what to bid for these instances based on historical pricing. Um, but again, that's not to say that you will not get instances that terminate. Again, the, the, the team measured this at about a rate of one in 50,000 sessions, which is really good, but you should still build a defensive measure into your game servers to accommodate that case. And for that, what you can do is uh, you can basically listen to, uh, there's a there's basically two events that one is on process terminated callback to your EC2 instance. And that'll tell you that the spot instance is being terminated in two minutes. And then if you're wondering how much time is left, you can query for the get termination time property. Um, and with those two things, um, you can add a little bit of logic to your game server. And now maybe you have a way to, uh, let's say, um, serialize the game session state and then reboot it on another instance, and then the players can uh, experience a slight interruption, and then they can resume playing. Right, so that's the kind of best experience that you can build, um, and all the tools are there, all the API calls are there for you to do that. So that's it for the the game with Fleet IQ announcement. 
yeah, some awesome stuff. I know, again, uh, Rob, you and I as gamers, uh, this this is uh, something that's directly beneficial to us. We, we'll enjoy games that are rolling this out. I've been playing a lot of uh, Battle Royales lately that are probably an amazing fit for this, right? Where the entire game session end-to-end can be uh, within the time limits or within the reasonable time limits for the notification for a spot uh, spot termination. Um, so I, I would not be surprised if a lot of those game development companies are, are uh, going to be looking into Fleet IQ immediately following this. Um, cool. Well, next up, uh, I think this section for me is going to be a little bit shorter than all of the, the exciting stuff around Fleet IQ, but it's you know no less important. Uh, and that's the GA of uh, AWS Chatbot. Sorry, uh, flipping over my words a little bit here. Um, so you know, at first glance, some folks are probably thinking, well, how does Chatbot compare to something like Lex? Uh, Lex again being purpose built for conversational agents. Chatbot is essentially a service built for chat ops. Uh, now, you know, in the world of folks wanting to re- monitor or receive notifications or perform resolution in certain scenarios, uh, there are a variety of different interfaces that are ideal for them. And maybe one isn't the only option, right? Some folks like the CLI, some like the console, others uh, may want to be able to be paged on their device. And Chatbot GA is, is a purpose-built service to enable folks to be able to have this two-way notification and sort of command um, flow. flow. Um, it allows you to monitor and interact with various AWS resources uh, and essentially sort of go the last mile for taking these alarms that you may have set up in something like CloudWatch uh, and, and enabling those to more easily be crafted and delivered to you wherever you may be. Um, so, you know, if you're someone who works sort of in, in site reliability engineering or, or in the DevOps world where you're trying to monitor uh, without having to stare at the AWS console or, you know, what other form of monitoring you may have, um, Chatbot enables you to sort of bring that closer to your preferred form of communication. Um, now, as far as integrations that are available with this GA launch, uh, you know, receiving alerts is, is perfectly native in in chat tools like Chime or Slack. I know many folks use those. Um, And again, you can essentially just consolidate these notifications that you may be getting from various sources all in one place. Um, I know people like to joke that there's sort of two big uh, trends in in software or in products, and it's it's either unbundling or it's bundling. Um, This is a really good uh, example, I think, of being able to sort of bundle these together and enable uh, folks to sort of uh, work in the way that they want, as opposed to having to feel like the tools are, are prescribing them a workflow, um, because I know every team works quite differently. So uh, as far as nuts and bolts of what this looks like in action, uh, you can respond directly to a lot of these commands with the native integrations, like in Slack, like in Chime. Uh, you can actually code your own sort of preferred sort of remediation steps in there that that can be included as default responses or options. Like in Slack, you can get a message and then have uh, buttons as responses or have default responses that you can pre-program. Um, now, additionally, one thing that I think is really exciting that folks will will really go to town with is uh, the fact that you can invoke arbitrary Lambda functions. So Lambda, again, for those that may not be familiar, are completely serverless, auto-scalable cloud functions where you can bring your own code, run it inside of um, this, this event-driven sort of implementation. Um, and in, in this instance, you can have the event be either a manual trigger or let's say you, you, know, you, you hit this one button that you want to perform a certain common remediation step. Uh, you can load that Lambda with whatever code uh, you want to do. Maybe this is restarting an instance. Maybe this is um, increasing the size of your auto-scaling group. Uh, essentially, any code that you want to write, you can include in that Lambda, and you can invoke that directly from Chatbot um, in the interface that you're using it or the service that you've integrated it with. So um, a pretty straightforward value proposition, I think, but one that I know a lot of people have sort of tried to build their own custom sort of proxies for. And it's really exciting whenever we see that customers have this demand or there's something that provides value to customers that they've been asking for um, that we can release as, as a G8 product. So very, very happy about this one. I know there was someone in Twitch chat that was uh, wondering about this one. Uh, we'll get the links for Chatbot thrown in uh, in Twitch chat here. So you can see a little bit about um, how to integrate that with Slack and Chime. Again, the examples I used, uh, as well as the Getting Started page. So if you're at all interested in Chatbot, you can go there to learn more. Yeah, and the other thing about Chatbots is even if you haven't used these this kind of chat ops functionality in Slack or Chime, uh, you know we have, we have Twitch users in chat here. And many of you have probably sat in channels where there is a bot answering questions. That's exactly what the experience is like, except that those things can then be turned into Lambda functions. They can pass the Lambda functions and they can drive uh, backend API operations on AWS infrastructure. They can spin up businesses, they can query for health status of services, they can do all sorts of stuff. You know, uh, now that you mentioned Twitch chat, it's like 
we could have an arbitrary, uh, a fun little hacky demo would be to have uh, an application that needs like remediation or this it's failing health checks, and we could hook it up, hook up chatbot to Twitch chat and see if give them a pool of commands that they could run and see if they could remediate it. That would yeah, actually yeah. Be, that'd be a pretty that fun like a great idea. Nick. Yeah, let, let's just let Twitch chat pipe SSH commands into the into our EC2 instances. <laughs> <laughs> no sanitization, just just pipe yeah, it straight yeah, yeah. in. <laughs> We'll we'll see. That's a that's an idea for another time, but definitely one that uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I want to do now. <laughs> well, I, well, maybe one day we'll run one of those like uh, Twitch tries to install Linux, you, you know, <laughs> kind of in line with uh, Twitch plays Pokemon. Yeah, I mean, we've been discussing that as a joke for a very long time. When can we make yeah. some Twitch plays the AWS console? But I think that Chatbot is actually the missing link here that we've been waiting for all along. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we yeah. got a question in chat from Evil uh, Evil AK or Evil Ack forty seven. Uh, will chatbot support Discord? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but uh, I'd assume the product page will show more. I, I don't know if it will comment on future integrations, um, but I'd love to be able to reach out to one of those service team members. Um, we will see if we're able to get that answer. Uh, you could also reach out to me on uh, Twitch chat directly, and I can respond with that answer. But I'll I'll, I'll tweet that out as well once I get a response. Great question. Yeah, cool. So uh, our next announcement here is related to infrastructure. And we have two infrastructure announcements uh, that we want to share with you. One is the general availability of the Africa Cape Town region. This is the South Africa region. This region is just open for general availability. And there are three AZs in this region. Uh, you should see a link in the chat very shortly. And then if you're curious, you can click on that link and you can see all the services that that region supports at launch. And the other thing is that we've added a third AZ for the Canada Central region. Uh, now, AZs, I want to take a moment to talk about this. A lot of people have already heard us talking about availability zones and regions and all these things, but it's worth repeating because it's a very important part of what makes AWS infrastructure work that the way the way that it does. So an AZ stands for an availability zone. And each region, when we say region, um, if you look at a map of AWS regions, they look like points on the map. But in reality, if you zoom in, that region is comprised of at least two availability zones. And in some cases, a region can consist of up to six availability zones. And the availability zone is, as the name implies, it's its own fault domain. So the, the architecture for a region is uh, it's very thoughtful. It's basically, um, we, we go visit a site and we basically say, how can we deploy the different availability zones in a way that maximizes these two trade-offs? Of one, we wanna make sure that they are independent fault domains. So in other words, if there's like a hurricane or a flood or a fire that no more than one of these AZs goes down at a time. So they have to be geographically separated by a meaningful amount of distance. But the second thing that we have to do with this availability zone architecture is that we have to basically lay down fiber network connectivity between them in a large enough amount so that we can maintain extremely low latency between these AZs. Some, we're talking about sometimes, you know, single digit millisecond, sub millisecond latency. And what that, allow, what that really low latency allows us to do is to deploy an application to a region that spans multiple AZs. And that application can use synchronous data replication techniques. Right, so there's no there's no secret sauce to high availability and durability. The 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 answer is just store multiple copies, um, and so when you're talking about let's say a relational database, for example, what you might have in an AZ is a write master that synchronously replicates all the writes to two backup AZs, and then if the master AZ goes down, if the write master goes down, then you do a failover and you bring up one of the the read replicas and you promote that into a write master. And while that is not going to be an instantaneous process with any, any modern database technology out there, um, it's still only going to incur a small delay. And the bottom line is that the application still remains available, right? The most, it might, it might just be a blip, um, a slight, uh, uh, slightly longer latency request. That's pretty good considering an entire AZ went down. And now that, that also shouldn't give you the impression that our AZs go down. They almost never go down. This is, we're talking about extremely, extremely rare events. So this infrastructure is there to make sure that your application can be architected in a way that provides the maximum amount of availability and uptime. And um, this is obviously important for mission critical workloads, but also, you know, if you build web applications or you're in e-commerce, uh, you know how frustrating it is when the infrastructure beneath you is unreliable and, you know, it's just not delivering. 
that will never be the case with AWS. The, this infrastructure is, is the, the AZ architecture, the way we build out our regions for high availability is one of the things that separates AWS from other cloud providers. And we're, we're happy to announce that, you know, we, both of these regions, uh, the Cape Town region and now the Canada Central region both have three AZs. Yeah, great explanation. I mean, I, I think the one thing that really resonates with me is sort of this high bar for what we consider to be a standalone region to meet our 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 standard for uh, availability and durability. And so when we're rolling out a region, you know, all of these questions of geographic isolation and fault tolerance with regards to isolated power supplies and every single or power sources in every single one of the data centers, uh, you know, these can be these can pose unique challenges in every single one of the regions. Um, a, a fun anecdote that I like to throw in here that I heard from someone else at, at AWS was that when we were trying to expand into Australia, um, there was uh, they were trying to work backwards to diagnose a, a unique problem, and they had gone through all the traditional routes to try and see why there was random packet loss in a certain scenario. Um, I don't even know if this was before it was you know broadly open. This was in testing, I believe, uh, and so. They, they had to go all the way down to some of the cables that were in the ground to, to try and check their assumptions about what could be working and what wouldn't be working. Uh, and they found that there was corrosion in some of the cables, uh, not because the cables were not high quality, but because there was a unique species of uh, insect or, or bug that literally chewed through the cables that was unique to that indigenous region in Australia. Uh, so, when, you know, when we talk about a region expansion, like these are the sort of questions and problems that get debugged, no pun intended, uh, leading up to their, their launch. And so we know that, you know, getting regions closer to where customers are and where, where companies are is important for low latency, uh, as well as for, uh, you know, compliance reasons uh, so that you can make sure that that is, you know, within your respective region where applicable. Um, and, you know, always adding to that global infrastructure map is, is a nice thing for customers. Customers are constantly asking. We're constantly trying to provide. Um, and if you'd like a deeper dive on the AWS global network, um, or the, the infrastructure sort of backbone there. Uh, I'll post a link in chat for infrastructure.aws. Uh, that's the entire URL. Uh, and there's a really cool demo there that actually outlines a lot of what we just spoke about between uh, the differentiation of, of AZs and regions and, and, um, and how they're connected uh, with, again, a lot of the things that Rob was able to so eloquently describe there. Yeah, that's a great link, by the way. That, that link also shows some of the... Um... Uh, the submarine cables that we've laid down for dedicated connectivity between regions. So uh, one of the other things that makes the ABS infrastructure so uh, so powerful is that there's this global network backbone that links all of the regions with one another. And this is dedicated bandwidth. This is this is basically a, a, a high speed. It's like an HOV lane for your internet traffic so that it's not competing with all the other traffic that's going across the internet. And so when you have communication between your applications between two AWS regions, it is Privileged. It, it is very lucky to be going across this kind of highly reliable, you know, low latency, uh, high bandwidth channel. Um, and so the global network is partly what makes all of this possible because a lot of applications, you know, they don't want to deploy to just one region because after all, region is still relatively geographically local. And so if you have customers all over the world and you want to bring them really good experiences by providing low latency, then your application often spans more than one region. And the thing that makes all the regions uh, uh, talk to one another is the global backbone. And that's another another really cool thing that's talked about in the um, in the two links that Nick and I share in chat. Awesome. Well, you know, again, recapping here on infrastructure expansion, new uh, region in South Africa for the, the new Cape Town region and adding a third AZ for additional uh, durability and availability up in the AWS Canada Central region. So some cool stuff there. We've got one more thing we want to talk about, though, before we start getting into the demos, uh, and that is TorchServe. This was actually announced very recently. I believe it was uh, either sometime this week or late last week. Um, this one is going to be for the machine learning AI folks in the audience. Um, and if I'm geeking out on AI stuff, uh, I'm sorry. I'll try to get through it quickly, but it's, it's a really cool announcement. I want to hopefully be able to convey why that is. Um, essentially, TorchServe is a PyTorch server for deploying models. Uh, it's, it's an open source code base. So essentially in the machine learning world, I'm not going to, I'll spare you all the explanation around machine learning 101, uh, but much like a lot of software, let's say I build an application um, that, that has some sort of functionality. I also need to be able to, to serve that uh, at endpoints through a server. Um, and so uh, in, in the Python world and a lot of the machine learning world, uh, there have not been a ton of purpose built 
uh, web servers for serving machine learning content, uh, for serving inferences for deployed machine learning endpoints. Um, I read a lot, of Py a lot of Python, so you know, you'll see a lot of tutorials out there previously for things like fl integrating Flask with Scikit-learn or you know, what have you, whatever the framework of your choice is, and it could have been PyTorch in the past. Uh, and while you know some of the other popular frameworks like TensorFlow um, have had their own versions or opinionated takes on a on a model serving uh, model serving server uh, in TensorFlow serving, uh, that was fairly exclusive to TensorFlow. So TorchServe is essentially uh, model serving infrastructure for uh, PyTorch with a lot of the bells and whistles that uh, folks had to typically roll themselves. These include things like being able to deploy multiple models and, and have dedicated, um, dedicated dedicated endpoints to each of them. Uh, along with that, native A-B testing where you can have one persistent endpoint that under the hood is going to route that to two separate models. Um, and g going hand in hand with that, you have the monitoring and the visualization of the metrics around those inferences. So I know there's a lot of work that has been done previously on trying to improve visualization for training and, and, and you know, visualize how the accuracy is changing as a function of time or across all the epochs. Um, but I think that as sort of the AI and ML space has matured and it's reached broader adoption. Um, a lot of folks are now wanting to know, you know, how are how is my model behaving in production? Um, there's a lot of generic modeling tools that exist or generic visualization tools that exist for that. But being able to bundle that all into sort of one purpose-built framework here uh, or web server uh, just become makes it a lot easier because you can just deploy this one web server with TorchServe to an EC2 instance or to a you know ECS container or something um, and and basically get this all baked in directly. And again, fully, it's completely free. It's fully open source. Um, we have a link to that directly in chat. Um, one last feature that it has that I missed was actually that it has built-in pre and post processing on your requests. So you can make your model in whatever format uh, you know you prefer or whatever the, the format the training data was in. Um, and then depending on the various sources you may have, you can have endpoints that have dedicated pre and post processing elements to them so that you can uh, have this one endpoint serve a variety of different consumers and, and give them different or have this server serve multiple consumers and have different endpoints depending on what pre and post processing you'll need. Uh, so some very exciting stuff. And it's actually available um, very easily with the EC2 Deep Learning AMI. Uh, you can go in there. There's actually a link to a blog post um, from two of our coworkers, actually, who uh, wrote the uh, What's New post introducing TorchServe, uh, as well as uh, get, being able to deploy uh, PyTorch models at scale using TorchServe on EC2 instances. Uh, and last thing uh, that I am remiss to, to have not said, uh, which you know, sort of goes along with what I was saying at the top, which is that um, anyone who's using PyTorch probably faces these problems or, or works with trying to deploy machine learning AI uh, solutions. And this is not unique to us here at Amazon or AWS. Uh, so we're really happy to have partnered with uh, Facebook on the co-development uh, of TorchServe because we know that, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of really great development comes out of uh, the ML teams over at Facebook, especially on PyTorch. Um, so we're happy to be able to get this in the hands of customers that we know it'll help a lot for. Cool. Well, I think that is going to about do it for us for the news segments. But if you've stuck around this far, well, we're just getting to the best part. We've got some demos coming up. First up is going to actually be AWS Deep Composer. So hang with us. We will be right back in about 30 seconds. Um, and hang tight. Yeah, we'll be right back. All right, we're back. Maybe a little longer than 30 seconds, but who's counting, right? Well, uh, We've got a really exciting demo here. Uh, we're talking a little bit about AWS Deep Composer. It's a service that ties in very nicely with a very nifty piece of hardware. Uh, and here to talk to us a little bit more about it is Jyoti Nukula, Senior Product Manager for Deep Composer. Jyoti, thanks for joining us on the show today. Hey. Hi, everyone. Really excited to meet and talk to you about Deep Composer. Hey, Jyoti. Welcome. Hey, Rob. Yeah, so uh, for the folks that weren't able to see Matt Wood playing Hot Cross Buns on the reInvent <laughs> world stage, uh, could you tell us a little bit about Deep Composer and uh, what's so fun about it? Yeah, yeah. So um, AWS Deep Composer gives developers a creative way to get started with machine learning. And with Deep Composer, developers can use a musical keyboard and the latest machine learning techniques like generative AI to expand their machine learning skills. However, I do want to point out that this is not a tool to develop production grade music, but instead this is a tool to learn about machine learning and we use music as a medium to make it hands-on and engaging. Uh, generative AI techniques like GANs are an advanced machine learning technique and with Deep Composer, developers can now learn these techniques in a hands-on way. Awesome. Uh, you mentioned so many things that I want to elaborate on. I mean, first and foremost, I think is, you know, again, 
emphasizing that this is a really fun way to get started with with machine learning and that uh, you mentioned it uses GANs, generative adversarial networks. Um, these are very exciting, uh, you know, uh, it's a very exciting class of, of machine learning or, or deep learning. Um, and, and so I, I've seen them typically used in use cases like being able to take a seed image uh, and generate that in a style, doing something called style transfer. Um, so essentially what we're working with here is uh, applying GANs to generating music instead of maybe pictures or video, right? Correct. Yeah. So in this case, it would um, it would take uh, your input melody as your as a starting point. The model would harmonize your input melody and then create an output composition, which is inspired by your input melody. The output composition would have uh, four part accompaniments added to it. Awesome. Um, but again, uh, an, a machine learning powered device. This sounds so familiar. How does this compare to some of the other ML devices? Because I, I know that you're definitely very familiar with those. Yeah, so as AWS, we have invested in putting machine learning into the hands of all developers by creating a portfolio of educational devices. Um, we started with AWS DeepLens, which helps developers get started with deep learning and computer vision. Then we announced AWS DeepRacer that helps developers get started with reinforcement learning. And now AWS Deep Composer joins the family um, and brings you generative AI. And generative AI is mentioned as the biggest advancement in AI in the last 10 years. And therefore, we are excited to present that uh, technology for uh, developers to learn and expand their skills. Yeah, super exciting. Again, uh, you know, being able to sort of uh, take the latest and what is really the latest and greatest in, in sort of machine learning research that can oftentimes be esoteric and hard for a lot of people to grasp and actually making that usable by folks that may have never used machine learning before. Definitely something that's very difficult, but uh, I think when folks see it in action, they're, they're really going to get an appreciation for it and hopefully uh, want to try it out on their own. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so uh, you can purchase the Deep Composer keyboard on Amazon.com for $99. And by purchasing the keyboard, you get three months of free trial. And what that allows you is to create 40 compositions and train four models every month. That's pretty nice. So what does it look like? That, that, that's the keyboard. That's the hardware, right? What is it? Um, is there a, like a software solution that you can use to, to compose songs if you don't have the hardware? Correct. So you can create compositions by using the virtual keyboard on the Deep Composer console. And you, uh, developers can use the uh, virtual keyboard to record an input melody. Then they can choose a machine learning model and generate an original composition. Awesome. So uh, just to recap then, essentially, we're, Deep Composer leverages GANs to be able to synthesize audio. Uh, and in our case, for Deep, for, for the for the service, it does so to provide a backing track based on the seed uh, music or melody that you provide. Um, so, you know, for the musical folks in the audience or, you know, ever, anyone who will use it because they'll find this out themselves, we'll provide the melody and then some of the other synthesized tracks will be like the, the drum or percussion, um, maybe a counter melody, maybe a bass line, uh, and then depending, and, and much like in, in style transfer with use of GANs, uh, there's, it's trained on some sort of, class an image or like a set of images to try and enable the GAN to capture the sort of sentiment of that of that image. Now with Deep Composer, I'd imagine in music, there's lots of different types of music, right? So the genre would essentially be the model that you're applying uh, for any particular synthesis. Yeah, so, so with Deep Composer, we do provide lots of um, uh, interesting input melodies that developers can use in the case uh, they don't want to use the keyboard to play. And they can also choose um, sample uh, machine learning models. Uh, we have provided models across uh, various genres. And so they can choose the genre and uh, choose the input melody and create a composition. And as I said, this is a tool not for uh, developing uh, production grade music. This is a tool to understand uh, the generative AI and uh, GAN algorithms. And therefore, uh, the the idea behind is through these experimentation, uh, developers will learn in a hands-on way about generative AI and how they work. Um, one of the things I feel like we should mention about GANs is that they're, uh, um, there's a, they're particularly interesting as far as ML techniques go, right? Because they're really, um, th there's actually two, con two pieces of this, of a GAN. There's the, the generator and the discriminator. And the generator is basically trying to fool the discriminator. So it's as if you've, you've kind of like set this loop up where you're like, can the machine outsmart the machine? 
Um, and then it's constantly going iterating over this loop. And that's that's the adversarial part of, of the acronym GAN, right? Um, so there's there's basically like in, in this case, in, in the general case, and then maybe uh, Juthi, Juthi, you can talk about how we apply this in decomposer, but in the general case, the, the generator will basically produce something that it thinks can trick the discriminator. And the discriminator is basically saying like, does this look like real music or does this look like a real image? Does this sound like real music? And so um, the tuning of those two things is also very interesting. And I hope you can talk about that. Yeah, definitely. In fact, I have a notebook that talks about the architecture that uh, is included in uh, AWS Deep Composer, and to and um, and usually I, uh, I give a uh, I use this analogy when I talk about GANs as this orchestra and a conductor. So like the orchestra practices music, and then you have this conductor who will give feedback, saying, "Hey, soft here," and then and and uh, and maybe more energy in in this place. And so the orchestra and the conductor. Um, iteratively learn practice iteratively and learn to produce a, a a great composition and i would say generators are something similar so the generator would create a synthetic output uh, which the discriminator would then say whether it's real or whether it's a synthetic one and then the generator would then use that same feedback to improve itself two questions or statements from chat that i wanted to call out um first one coming from gman asking uh, do you need a specific keyboard to be leveraging Deep Composer. And the exciting answer there is no, you can actually bring your own keyboard. So if you have a MIDI keyboard lying around, you can actually hook that up over USB to your uh, to your computer, and you can actually start using that directly with Deep Composer. Uh, and if you don't have one, the Deep Composer offering with both the, you know, the hardware as well as the software bundled in for $99 on Amazon uh, is a really easy way to get started um, if you don't have one of those already. So yes, bring your own keyboard is compatible. Uh, and then we had one more statement. Uh, yeah, it was less of a question, but uh, someone giving the pun about hands-on learning with like quite literally <laughs> hands on the keyboard. Yes, it's um, quite literal, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that's enough from the uh, comedy hour from me. I think we everyone wants to see the demo. So would that be possible, Jyoti? Yes, absolutely. Let me share my screen. Yeah, we have someone that wants to get uh, the Deep Composer in the hands of Daft Punk. So awesome. hopefully we can get an unboxing video from them. Yep, yep. <laughs> Are you able to see my screen? Yep, coming through clear. Awesome. So this is the console for, um, uh, AW, uh, for Deep Composer. And you can access this console by visiting console.aws.amazon.com slash Deep Composer. Uh, make sure you are in the U.S. East, North Virginia region. That is the AWS region. And so, okay, let's get started. So uh, to get started, uh, you can learn about the basics of generative AI and GANs by following a short 15-minute tutorial. And if you're interested to dive deeper to understand about generative AI and GANs, you can also uh, look at the learning capsules, the First learning capsule is the introduction to GANs. Um, and all of these learning capsules have been curated by uh, AWS experts. And these would take about 45 to 60 minutes uh, for you to complete. I'm going to go to the music studio, which is where you would provide an input melody and uh, select your machine learning algorithm to create a composition. So as you can see, there is a virtual keyboard that you can use. Uh, uh, if you have um, uh, the AWS Deep Composer keyboard, you can plug it in and uh, use that as well. For this demo, I'm, I'm going to use the virtual keyboard. And we provided uh, sample input melodies that developers can use, uh, especially those who don't want to play a keyboard to start with. And But they can still uh, use these uh, input melodies to get started with uh, learning generative AI. I'm going to choose uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And Let's actually listen to it once. All right. So now I'm going to choose a machine learning model. So we have provided several machine learning sample models that you could use that's uh, uh, filtered by the genre. So for this one, I'm going to choose maybe rock. And I'm going to, let me scroll down so you can see the buttons. Um, so I'm going to choose that select model. 
and essentially that's that's it and i'm going to say generate composition and what would happen here is the model would take the input melody harmonize it and create an output composition that has four part accompaniment so essentially the model is trained in a way to take a monophonic uh, input which is an input with just one track and create a polyphonic uh, uh, composition that is a composition with uh, many tracks and in this case it's four so let's listen to Uh, we also provide several instruments that you could uh, change. Um, the ones that are created here are AI generated. And so like, for example, I could um, use uh, a different instrument um, and, and maybe it change the type of composition or the flavor of composition. The second piece is you could also provide your own input melody. So let's say um, I'm going to use the virtual keyboard in this case. Um, so let's, let's begin recording. Uh, I play very bad music, so please bear with me. Um, uh, Mary had a little lamp and this is function or a feature that I really love is this rhythm assist. This function um, or this feature really helps to automatically correct the timing of your musical notes and it's particularly helpful if you have the right notes in your input melody but um, the notes are not aligned to the beat. So like for example let me show you let me turn it off and you'll see that the notes have the way I played it original, there were some notes that were not aligned uh, uh, to the beats. And so when I turn it on, you would see that it would get aligned to the, uh, to the time. And yeah. then again, just like usual, I would go ahead and, and uh, choose a different sample model, um, select the model, and then I can go ahead and create the composition. Uh, just like previous uh, uh, demo that we saw, it's, it's going to create um, a composition with several um, uh, several instruments and accompaniments added to it. And this is an original composition that's inspired by, um, uh, by your input melody. So let's get back to the twinkle twinkle and the pop. And I don't actually remember if I made you listen to the generated composition. Uh, we did. We heard the the rock one from the awesome. pre-recorded input. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Then then. That's while good. you're queuing up the next one, we had a question from chat from Sysec wondering: uh, Is it possible to upload a monophonic track of of a melody that they've recorded elsewhere outside of the browser, uh, or do they have to record it directly here? Uh, they have to record it directly in the console. Okay. Yeah. Another question from the Brad Gardner: Any plans on integrating the pitch and modulation wheels on the Deep Composer keyboard? Yeah, so there are, uh, uh, in, if, um, in the settings, um, let me get back to that. Uh, there, is, um, there are options to, uh, to adjust the tempo, uh, and you can turn on the metronome if you want, or turn it off. Uh, we are looking at adding several other uh, capabilities um, as part of our roadmap. Um, so right now we have uh, just the pitch, uh, sorry, the tempo adjustment. Yeah, it's a really interesting question uh, from Brad Gardner because, especially when you're thinking about training uh, again, uh, in order for it to try and have some sort of learned performance on pitch modulation, you'd have to have that labeled data in your training set, right? Which I know is often very hard because when you're doing bends and 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 pitch swings, uh, quantifying that can sometimes be difficult. I mean, even as a musician, you're describing that to someone like as a guitarist, it's like a you know describe it as like a slow into quick bend up to the next fret, like quantifying that uh, from on a musical staff is sometimes pretty difficult, um, but definitely a cool cool thing to look forward to in the future if we could get that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I also want to show you how you can train your own model uh, in the console. Um, 
the way I, I got to this page was essentially by uh, navigating on using the left nav, um, went into models, and then I said, create a model, and then you'd come into this page. Uh, the cool thing about uh, training a model using Deep Composer is that you can train a, a GAN model without uh, writing even a single uh, line of code. Um, and the way we allow you to do that is we provide these two architectures. Uh, one is a MuseGAN, the other is a unit. You can always read about what they are and how the architecture helps um, uh, in the context of uh, the model that you're training. And you choose the training data set. For example, for unit, it is just um, uh, Buck. But if you go to MuseGAN, you can see that there are several other data sets that you could use. Um, you can uh, adjust the hyperparameters and then say, start training. And then Deep Composer would take care of setting up your instances and creating the entire model training infrastructure pipeline for you. So, you, so that you can focus on uh, optimizing your uh, uh, model. And the model that you train uh, using, um, uh, using the Deep Composer, you can bring it back into Music Studio uh, in the case if you want to like create a custom, uh, use a custom model uh, for your melody. And for those who want to dive deeper and, and get into the, uh, into the crux of how a GAN model is built and, and look at it layer by layer and build it from scratch, we also provide a GAN notebook. Uh, it's essentially a Jupyter notebook that you could uh, import into Amazon SageMaker and, uh, and play around with the uh, hyperparameters and even change the structure of your model by adding more layers, for example. Um, you can find uh, this notebook in our GitHub repo. Uh, it would be in AWS samples, AWS Deep Composer samples. Um, and then um, uh, you can find this in lab two and the notebook is titled uh, GAN IPython notebook. So I'm gonna give you a quick tour of this notebook. Uh, it talks about what is a generator, what is a discriminator, something that I was uh, we were chatting with uh, Rob earlier, uh, talking about how the generator provides the generated output into the discriminator for it to classify whether it's the real uh, music or whether it's the synth synthetic generated uh, music. And this feedback is fed back to the generator for it to improve. And this is done iteratively until the generator creates uh, music that sounds uh, realistic or even images, for example, that, that look realistic. And in our case, it's music. And so it's going to be sounds. And we provide the uh, the code uh, that developers can use, um, starting with um, uh, loading the dependencies, configuration, and then we talk about the data set. Uh, we talk about the data set that we use uh, for this notebook and how we represent it. This is an interesting representation. It's very similar to how you would represent a computer vision uh, image uh, for, for a computer vision problem, uh, wherein it's a matrix with time and pitch uh, as its axis. And a one or zero in any particular cell represents if a note was played or not. Um, and, and so it's, it's like, your, like your image that you use for your computer vision problems where uh, the image is converted into a matrix. And so in this case, we are converting the uh, input melody into a matrix. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Like for an image, you basically have X by Y pixels and each pixel and yep. has a value of, you know, whatever based on the RGB value or whatever form CMYK, I don't know, whatever your standard yep. representation of that is. I know in computer vision, it ends up becoming black and white. So it's just a number between zero and one anyway. Uh, but in music here, I'd imagine that looks like something like a, an array for every tick or every potential beat in the music. Um, and then it's represented by uh, the, the musical note is sort of like a one hot encoding array, maybe uh, for every single possible pitch, uh, all the way up from the bottom note to the top note. And if it's being played, it's a one. If it's not, it's a zero. Yeah. And uh, uh, and like your RGB, your channel would be three in, in an image here. In this case, it would be the number of instruments. So if you have like one track, it would be one. If you have a four track, it would be four, for example. Cool. Good stuff. So um, uh, going further, uh, you'd load your data. We provide these um, hyperparameters that you can go and change. You can change the number of data samples in your batch. You can change the uh, buffer size. You can uh, change the prefetch size. And each of these are explained in the markdown text. And so you can essentially change these parameters. And now let's take a look at the architecture of the model itself. Uh, the 
The model that we use uh, in AWS Deep Composer is a UNET um, architecture. It's a very popular algorithm uh, used in computer vision applications. And as you can see, its name is derived from the shape of the algorithm. The left represents the encoding uh, layers and the right is the decoding layers. And so it would, you would downsample and then uh, upsample um, the, uh, uh, the input melody to be able to generate uh, an output composition. And we talk about the filter size um, and, um, and the input shape. Uh, for example, in this case, it's 32 by 128. It's one because there's only, it's a monophonic um, input uh, melody. Um, and so it's one and your filter size is 64. You can go and change things like your stride. Um, in this case, it's the deconvolution layer has a stride of one, but you'd see the convolution layer has strides of two. You can change these strides and you can also change the shapes or your, your filter uh, sizes such that your uh, final output, uh, if with 64, you'd get uh, 512 of two by eight grids. And so if you change your filter size, this number would also change. And we also provide this latent shape. Uh, it's a vector uh, which essentially allows the output to be uh, a diverse set of output, even when the same input or same input melody is provided every single time to the model. And so uh, if you do change the filter size, make sure you change these latent shape uh, vectors as well so that um, it aligns to, um, uh, to the final output. And then let's look at the discriminator. Our discriminator consists of four uh, layers of convolutional neural networks and uh, followed by a dense layer. And again, um, the input uh, shape would be very similar to the one um, that, that, uh, that's created from the uh, generator. And one thing I did want to uh, show you, which I think I missed, uh, is the number of instruments. So as you can see, the, num the number of instruments we have uh, uh, plugged in here is four. That's because our data set has a maximum of four instruments that it can add. Uh, so let's say if you do want to like play with these parameters, you can go ahead and, uh, and choose any number that's below four if you're using the same data set. So for example, you can choose three or two or even for fun experimentation, you can find other data sets and maybe plug in that data set into, into this notebook that you, so that you import um, this additional other data set and then you can go and change all these parameters. So let's look at, um, yeah, and so you'd, you'd build your, your critic layer by layer. Um, so again, you can see how each of our layers are built. You can add more layers, but if you do add more layers, ensure that you change the filter sizes and shapes accordingly. And you, that's it, you just begin, you start training. Uh, we use Adam Optimizer and you can, you can read about uh, the specific type of GAN that we use. We use a Wasserstein GAN with a gradient penalty. Uh, and I'm not going to take time over here explaining what a WGAN GP is, but you can uh, go and um, you can definitely take a read at the notebook, uh, which explains in, uh, what, what Wasserstein GAN is in detail. And you can further um, go ahead and evaluate your model. There's all of these good data to say when, how do you know your model is learning? How do you know when to stop? Especially because there are two competing networks here. And so you can evaluate your results. You can plot your loss functions. And um, the best part is you can do an inference right inside this notebook, wherein you can uh, bring in your own uh, MIDI file. Uh, in this case, I just chose to choose the Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, the same MIDI um, input melody. And you can run it by your custom model that you created and listen to the output right here. So, yeah. so, so uh yeah. So. I'm really excited about seeing how uh, how developers take this, and and I'm I'm super excited to see what comes from the developer community. Yeah, and I think that you know more than anything, this is such an interesting peek under the hood of all that gets abstracted away when you use the Deep Composer console, right? Like this so, was you know in this notebook again, some folks are asking like you know what is this written in? You know this is this is Python using some of the primitives and and the frameworks that folks use to to build these uh, oftentimes very complicated. Uh, 
neural network scans in this case with things like Keras I saw in there Correct. Uh, and, and beyond. Yeah. And even Keras, you know, abstracts a bunch of underlying libraries like NumPy and, and Arrow and you yeah. know, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so, you know, really cool to be able to say, hey, is music interesting to you? You can approach Deep Composer, start with the console and, and, and go deeper and deeper in, in sort of the tech stack. Uh, in a very iterative sort of way here. You know, we mentioned before that while in the console, you may not be able to provide your own uh, audio files um, as input, but here you could retrain on one of the existing training sets, get a yep. feel for what that looks like, and then actually supply your own audio files in here on a, on a Jupyter notebook. So, um, you know, anything is kind of possible here. Uh, it just comes down to how much, you know, you want to sort of dig through uh, and get your feet wet. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I've got a question from Omidi. He asks, uh, is it true that we want strong mathematics knowledge to work and learn AI? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give my answer and then Nick and Jyoti, I wanna hear yours. Uh, so I think that we have to distinguish between the different layers of, of uh, what we're trying to accomplish with AI. Uh, certainly at the machine learning level, when you're hands-on and you're trying to build out these models, you're trying to fiddle around with these algorithms, it's important to develop a foundational understanding of these techniques. And that certainly requires some amount of mathematics, uh, because after all, uh, all of this stuff, all, all this AI, you know, AI is a, is a buzzword these days. You know, a lot of people, the layman com confuses it with artificial general intelligence, which, which is not. It's actually just applied statistics. Right. And so if you don't know the statistics part, then you're going to have a hard time grasping a lot of the, the, um, the foundational building blocks. But separate from what we would consider kind of ML level services, which is where uh, SageMaker sits, um, we have a lot of AI services on AWS. Uh, examples of these services are uh, Lex and Poly and Transcribe. And these are turnkey AI solutions. You don't need to know anything about machine learning because the models are pre-trained for you, right? So if you, uh, for example, if you want to turn text to speech or speech to text, that can work out of the box uh, for a number of different languages without you needing to go through any of this training process. Um, what we're looking at here is, kind of, is, is it's, deeper than that. It's not a turnkey service. It's saying, look, look at this cool music you can make. If you just lift up the hood, check all of the algorithms that are going on underneath. And I think it does require a little bit of hands-on knowledge, but more, more so it's a gateway. It's an invitation to start learning this stuff. Nick and Jyoti, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I definitely echo that sentiment. I think it comes down to like, especially if you're trying to operationalize ML or AI at a company, think about, you know, like, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Are you trying to generate audio, right? Or are you trying to uh, be able to classify data or segment it or uh, make inferences about uh, and forecasting for a particular numerical uh, value, right? So even within ML and AI, it's easy to look at the huge body of, of knowledge that you could have and say, oh, well, that seems like a lot. But I think that, you know, if you're, it's either for a company or there's a certain subset of this that, that is really interesting to you, um, then it becomes uh, much more targeted. There's a much more targeted path to trying to make that actionable. Uh, another thing that I would say is that, you know, there's a big difference between the academic community crafting new algorithms from scratch um, and being able to apply those. So this is sort of where, like, do you really want to work on theory or do you really want to work on implementation? Um, and much like in regular science, I, I think this applies here to ML as well. Um, you know, one is in creating algorithms that are better than previous algorithms that can achieve things that we couldn't prior. Another may be how to apply an algorithm to achieve a business outcome. Um, or applying a you know an algorithm in a novel way that we may not have thought about before, right? Um, and and so sometimes depending on the level of abstraction of of where you want to work, like there is so much greenfield to just use existing algorithms and use existing frameworks that are much more of a software engineering problem than a math problem. Um, so yeah, it depends. Uh, is sort of the short answer, but you know, Jyoti, I'm sure I'm sure you have some more insight. Yeah, so um, uh, the whole uh, the whole uh, concept of us launching these educational devices is to make it really easy for developers to learn about these con complex machine learning techniques in a very hands-on way. And the idea behind is to uh, is to enable developers to get that intuition by experimenting and and changing these parameters. Though we use music in Deep Composer, it is not only for someone with a music application. It's the idea behind is understand how generative AI works. Uh, and as you saw, we are, we, are, we are leveraging UNET, which is a computer vision algorithm. So pretty much you can learn uh, with Deep Composer, take that knowledge and take it to other applications like even image, text, uh, uh, 
uh, NLP, for example. It's, it's a very broadly applicable technique that you learn with Deep Composer. And the, the, the idea that we are trying to do here is to uh, abstract some of that complexity so that you, you as a developer don't need to learn the, um, the concepts of like the mathematical concepts to even begin experimenting. You can begin experimenting with, um, with the console using just simple navigation and UI. And, and slowly dig into the uh, algorithms as you get more comfortable with understanding the intuition behind. So that, that actually brings up an interesting question. You know, we, talk, we talked about Deep Composer as a means to learning uh, machine learning by way of, uh, you know, particularly uh, uh, GANs. Uh, and you talked about this kind of learning journey that the developer goes through as they're using Deep Composer. Uh, Let's say that you know they go through this this journey. What 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 happens after that? What's next? Like they, let's say they they've customized Deep Composer, they've fiddled around with the different parameters, they've built some music that they really like, they've uploaded to SoundCloud. How do they continue that journey on AWS? Yeah. So once uh, once you're comfortable with uh, generative AI, you can pretty much take this and apply it to any other application. So let's say you are um, uh, you are a product designer and you're trying to get inspiration on the next generation product designs you can pretty much use the same algorithm and the same um, uh, technique, uh, take it into your Amazon SageMaker, create your notebooks and uh, begin your experiments where you can uh, use the machine learning algorithms to generate your next product designs, maybe your clothing, maybe your handbags, maybe an automobile design uh, and get an inspiration from there to, to, create your, uh, to create your next collection. Or even let's say you're a company like say, uh, you're in oil and gas and uh, you want to develop a machine learning model for specific for your use case. And as is always the case, uh, uh, data is limited. You don't have a lot of data. And so what you could do with GANs is generate a synthetic data set that could then augment uh, so that your, your machine learning model can now be more ro uh, robust just because you have um, a wide variety of diverse uh, data sets. Awesome. Well, Jyoti, thank you so much for joining us on the show this week. You gave some great live demos. I know Twitch chat has very high standards, but you definitely met and exceeded those. So thank you again for that. Again, Jyoti from the Deep Composer team talking to us a little bit about Deep Composer's recent uh, GA launch, generally available, uh, as well as you know a little bit of a discussion here at the end on machine learning AI and its role uh, you know, with you trying to deliver that value to a company or, um, you know, how you should go about learning that. I, I think we all are sort of on the same page with it being, uh, you know, carve out one path, sort of go towards it. And there's lots of different opportunities for you to take an ML and AI. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be on this show. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Jyoti. It's been a real treat. All right. Well, I promised we'd have multiple demos. We've got one more lined up. Uh, stick around. We're going to take a quick 30 second break again. Uh, you can time me if you really want. All right, we're back a little longer than 30 seconds, but uh, we'll make up for that time in the next episode, I promise. Uh, here, we are going to be talking a little bit about a very exciting launch, and this one's called AppFlow. Uh, again, a new service from the folks here at AWS. Uh, Venkatesh Krishnan is product lead for integrations and platform enterprise tools. Uh, Venkatesh, thank you for joining us, and please, let's talk a little bit about AppFlow. You know, this is something a lot of folks have been excited about. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it is from a broad perspective? Sure, this is a service that we launched just two days ago. So it's just two days old. <laughs> it's a fully managed integration service that enables our customers to move data easily between various SaaS applications that they are using in their businesses, like Salesforce, Marketo, ServiceNow, Slack, and various AWS services. It's a no code service. So it makes it really easy for you to be able to move your data across these applications and realize the benefits of integrated data. So it's, it's pretty straightforward to come into the console, set up a flow, 
and specify when and where and how the data should move. You can add processing to the data um, and you can do some masking. You can do some cool transformations with the data. And once you set up your flow, we take it on from there. So uh, when the trigger happens, we will pick up the data from the source, apply processing and set it to the destination. Yeah, so it's a brand new integration service that's, uh, that's targeted for users and lines of business, enabling them to build their own integrations without having to spend time coding. That's awesome. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the problem? Why would I need to move, why would I need these integration solutions? What kind of situations do I, what are the symptoms where I would reach for a solution like this? So our customers are increasingly adopting SaaS applications like for CRM, customer relationship management, for enterprise resource planning, for, you know, hit CIM, which is, um, you know, human capital management. So for all these different business applications, our customers are increasingly adopting SaaS applications. And there's a lot of valuable data in each one of these applications. And what customers want is to be able to pull all of that together so that they can realize, you know, benefits of integrated data. Like for example, customers want to be able to aggregate it in data lakes and apply machine learning on top of it to draw new insights. Or they want to be able to connect these uh, applications together so that there is a seamless flow of data and this process automation. But today what happens is for them to be able to integrate these applications, they have to build custom connectors, which means they have to write code to call APIs, pull data, and manage all aspects of building that connectivity. AppFlow solves this problem for them. It takes on the heavy lifting of connecting to these different applications and moving data for them without them really having to write that code. So it makes it super easy for them to be able to realize the benefits of connecting these different application silos, of being able to connect them to the AWS ecosystem and have a seamless yet secure flow of data. I feel like I need a, uh, you know, one of those either like those desk service bells or like one of those hand bells to ring because in the way you just described it to me, uh, that makes me want to scream undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? I know this is a very specific term that we use all the time at AWS, but essentially if there is a problem that requires an amount of effort, particularly engineering effort to solve, uh, you know, this is something that's not uniquely providing your business value. You don't want to spend time doing it, but you feel like you have to, you're locked into it, right? Building all these connectors is not providing value. You just do it so that you can get access to the data. Um, and then on the AWS side, we want to solve these problems for our customers. So, uh, this is where I'd ring that bell and go, okay, I get it. This is exactly why folks need a service to be able to provide this value. Right. Yeah. And, and one of the things that occurred is, as you were talking about that problem, Venkatesh, is that. The, these systems that you're mentioning, you know, these CRM systems like Salesforce and Marketo, you know, these are uh, often called the brains of the company, right? Because they store the, the, the critical information, the sales pipeline, the customer leads, that kind of thing. Um, and so that information is also probably very sensitive to the company and securing that information in the process of building these integrations, this kind of goes back to your point, Nick, about the end of have lifting. Not only does it take time to build, it takes time to build in a way that is secure. Right. And so uh, maybe you could talk about um, what, what kinds of security guarantees that, that we offer with AppFlow and maybe we can highlight that in the demo. Sure, sure. Well, so AppFlow raises the bar on security in two ways. Right? Of course, data in transit and data at rest are always encrypted by default, right? So you don't have to do anything. We'll always encrypt the data when we pick it up from the source and we send it to the destination. But you can also choose whether you want us to use our own managed keys Right? So AWS has its own managed customer keys that we can use to encrypt data, in which case you have to do nothing. Or you can choose to bring in your own keys. So when you choose to bring in your own keys, you have additional control over what policies you can apply on those encryption keys. You can even revoke those keys. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility that we offer. And all of this is without coding, right? So you just point and click and pick what you want. You choose either, you don't click a button, then we use the default. You click a button and choose your key, then we use the key that you provision for it. Yet another aspect of security that uh, AppFlow provides is with regards to privacy in data transfer. So with SaaS applications that have integrated with AWS private link, AppFlow ensures that the data transfers happen entirely over the private backbone of AWS. So we pull data in over private endpoints we actively manage those endpoints. So customers don't see anything that's under the hood. So it's straightforward. Say, tell AppFlow to connect to uh, an application or private link. 
we will automatically set up the underlying network infrastructure, transact the data, and move it to the destination such that it never sees the public internet. So this prevents data leakage, it prevents, um, you know, uh, it reduces the risk of attack from internet based attack vectors. So, yeah, I mean, one thing that I, I think we haven't, you know, even touched on significantly here is like this solves a massive engineering problem and it does it in a way that enables lots of non-engineering pe- uh, employees to be able to access and, and perform the same action. You know, this is a no code solution. You yes. know, you're not just abstract, like giving out open cor- open source code samples for these connectors that we've built. Like it's fully wrapped or, uh, wrapped up in this and buttoned up in, in a console based solution. Um, and, and I know we just talked about how much of that is now abstracted under the hood uh, in the service that customers don't have to worry about. Uh, but then the, the the thing that I immediately think about there is, well, OK, it's wonderful that these the underlying infrastructure for some of this gets abstracted. Um, but maybe what if I need some fine tuning knobs in, in the back of my head? I think about things like scale. Um, I, I'm, it's great that it's managed, but how is this going to scale up? Do I have any concerns around that? Uh, maybe yeah. talk a little bit to how AppFlow handles scalability. Right. Sure. So we built this service to serve the diverse integration requirements that our customers have. So when we go talk to our customers and ask them, hey, what are your general data integration requirements? We hear a very broad range of these requirements. Some of them are near real time where they say, I want this data to go within seconds from one application to the other, right? So it's almost near real time transfer of data. At the other end of the spectrum, and this spectrum is like fully populated, right? So you have everything in between. At the other end of the spectrum, you have large volumes of data transfers, like they want to transfer gigabytes of data, uh, perhaps once in a week or once in a day or once in a month for backup purposes for, for hydrating data lakes. So you have this diversity of use cases. And so to address these, we built a service that scales across these requirements, right? So you can come in and set up a flow that transfers data in near real time, small volumes of data, and we will transfer it within a few seconds. Or at the other end, you can transfer gigabytes of data, right? Hundreds of megabytes to gigabytes of data. And instead of asking the customers to come in and break up their jobs into multiple batches that can transfer that larger volume, we do it in one shot. So we handle all the pagination that is needed. We handle everything under the hood that is needed to transfer that large volume of data, maybe make multiple calls and batch that data and send it. We handle all of that, take care of errors that happen, maybe make multiple API calls. All of that is wrapped under the hood. And what you get is a neat interface that's, that you can come and say, move this data, and we will take care of moving. So it's, it's a, we, we scale all the way from a few kilobytes near real time to hundreds of megabytes, gigabytes, uh, even uh, you know, in one shot. Yeah, and so, so far we've been talking about a lot of these these non-functional capabilities of AppSync itself, uh, uh, um, or sorry, AppFlow. Um, can you give us a concrete example? What is it, what, is, what are some example use cases that we're talking about here that kind of stitches all of these things together? So when we look at what our customers have told us, um, we can broadly classify their use cases into two buckets. One is the data lake use case. Right, so customers use these applications like Salesforce, Marketo, ServiceNow, Zendesk, Google Analytics, InfoNexus. They use these applications quite extensively and there's there's valuable data in these applications that they want to be able to aggregate on data lakes on an S3 that's built on S3, right? So they want to bring this data into a bucket in S3 and they want to keep that fresh. So they want to be able to bring data on a periodic basis, maybe even in near real time keep that data fresh so that they can run analytics against it, right? So they may want to update a dashboard on a weekly basis, but do it automatically instead of having to manually move that data. The other uh, use case is to be able to run machine learning models against it, right? So get an inference about a lead score, but it doesn't stop there. It's also, uh, it's also the last mile. As soon as you generate a lead score, you want to be able to take that and take it, bring it back into these applications because they are the systems of engagement for users in lines of business. So you want to be able to automate this whole process where you're bringing data in from different sources into data lakes, you're running analytics, you're you're running machine learning, you get some insights and then you want to send that back. The second bucket of use cases uh, are with, you know, automating processes, right? So when something changes in one application, send that change downstream 
so that other systems can be aware of it. Like something, a new opportunity is created or there's a new contact in Salesforce. I want to make sure that that contact, as soon as the new contact uh, is saved in Salesforce, my Redshift table is updated. And that's exactly the demo I'm gonna show you. Uh, I'm gonna show you a demo where something is um, you know, updated in Salesforce and that uh, is almost in near real time available in Redshift. So those are some of the common use cases that we've heard from customers. Yeah, this is really cool. Like as you describe the entire sort of end-to-end -end workflow here, I try to imagine a scenario where you'd code this from the ground up with some of the, the AWS primitives like you have an underlying database, you can have an uh, SNS topic, and you know you can have lambdas to sort of funnel these events both ways. Uh, subscribing to the different SNS topics, um, you know, this this is really cool uh, to, to 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 be able to see this as a no code solution. I'm I'm excited to see it in action um, because I really think that again, this is such a force multiplier for anyone who's having to work with these integrations, and even beyond that, more than a force multiplier, it's opening this capability up to a lot of folks that would not have been in a lot of organizations that may have not have been able to you know, build this in-house. Yeah, uh, one of the things I also wanted to add is it's bi-directional in nature. So it's not just about bringing data into AWS. You can also take data from AWS and send it to other applications, right? So it's, it's more about providing that network effect, uh, you know, providing the benefits of being on the AWS ecosystem where you're able to freely, easily, but securely move data across different applications and services. Let me play this back to you based on what I've been hearing so far, make sure I understand this correctly. It sounds like what you're saying is, you know, this increased use of these SaaS solutions is creating these kind of data silos. And the data silos are, are really, I mean, there's a lot of business intelligence embedded in there. And unfortunately, when, when it's siloed like that, it's very hard to kind of unlock some of the relationships between this data and to apply custom workflows to this data. And what you're really talking about here is um, a, a, a no code solution for some of these integrations it's not that it, it's, it's, you're not doing the work to generate the insights at the end. You're just saying we can now have all of this consolidated in, in Redshift in a, in, a, in a custom way in your own data lake. And that way you can run your, your ML processes over that. Is that does, it, is, does that sound like a fair summary? Absolutely. And one of the things that both uh, Robert, you and Nick hit upon is uh, what, how easy it is to use and uh, how uh, the value of a no code solution. And one of the reasons why we built it is because there are users in lines of business, the CRM administrators, the BI specialists and others who really benefit from free flow of data. And now those users in the customer organization are able to build their own integrations by using this service. Yeah, and I'm glad you sort of landed on that because I had one question that you know came to mind for myself, but I also know some people on Twitter around the announcement had had a similar question. Um, you know, when we're thinking about this sort of data integration uh, as a problem and and app flow as a solution to that, uh, this starts to sort of beg the question of you know, well, how does this compare to things like Event Bridge or Data Exchange? And I know that there's a they're all built for different purpose built. They're purpose built for different problems. Um, one in particular here that jumps out as more similar is probably EventBridge. Uh, could we sort of walk through how this compares or sort of the different motivations? Yeah, so uh, EventBridge is a service that enables uh, developers on AWS to be able to ingest events from partner uh, sources. Let's say, for example, you have Zendesk events uh, and you are a Zendesk customer and you want to be able to trigger a downstream process in AWS by which is triggered by that event in Zendesk, you set up event bridge so that the Zendesk event gets published on the partner event bus, and then you can trigger a Lambda and you can do so many things downstream with it. AppFlow is about data transfers, right? So data transfers, data and events are related. Event represents a change in state of data, but AppFlow is targeting users and lines of business and provides them a tool that they can use to move data easily from different sources. It can be triggered by events, right? So a data transfer can be triggered by events and that's where the synergy comes into play. Wonderful. So yeah, slightly different uh, use cases, slightly different levels of abstraction between them. Um, and I think maybe this will all be a little bit more clear maybe when we see it in action, right? I, I know that- right. A lot of times when I find myself telling folks that uh, something is easy to use, I know that you know I'm much more convinced when I can see it okay. than, than just having someone tell me it's easy. Um, yeah. You mentioned before that there's a particular scenario we're gonna walk through with, uh, you know, I think it was Redshift and, and Salesforce you may have said. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's actually walk over to the demo then and see that in action. Okay, so bear with me as I share my screen. Yeah. 
Okay, so the demo that I'm going to show you today is um, is an event-driven data transfer. So as I mentioned, you will have, uh, let's say you have data in Salesforce, you have your customer contacts in Salesforce. You want to be able to ingest certain aspects of that data, not all fields, perhaps a few fields from that Salesforce object. You want to bring it into Redshift, but you want to keep that data fresh. So as soon as a new contact is created in Salesforce, you want to be able to trigger an action that pulls that data and brings it into AWS. So that's the demo I'm going to show. So we start by going into the console. Just bear with me as the thing loads up. Yeah, no worries. Uh, we actually had um, a, uh, while we're waiting on this, we had some one in chat asking, you know, integration or combining AppFlow and Chatbot as, as a possible uh, sort of vector for uh, distributing or, or making changes on some of the uh, the data that, that is created or, or transferred, I suppose. Yeah, so that it's definitely thing, something that we have in our mind. We're looking at ways that we can enable our customers uh, to do more with their data. And so, yeah, we work backwards from what they want and we build integrations. Okay, so shall I go ahead with the demo? Yep. Okay, cool. So you go into the console, you can locate AppFlow in the application integration category. So you just go look for it, scroll down into application integration. And yeah, that's Amazon AppFlow. So you click on it and you're taken to the AppFlow console. I'm gonna set up a Redshift table that will that will receive the data. So uh, clicking on Redshift up there. Okay, so this is the table I've set up. I've set up a customer contact table. It's got four fields in it. Uh, it's got a name, it's got company, title, and email. So I set this up. Uh, you can see it's, uh, it's pretty much an empty table. So I'm gonna run the table just to make sure it's empty. So this is just to this is just, you create a table. So this is where we will be putting our data. So the data that we are pulling from Salesforce will be inserted into this Redshift table. And again, uh, for folks that may not have used Redshift before, a data warehousing solution, fully managed. And the the query you're writing at the top there is some basic SQL, right? Yeah, I, all I did was, uh, that's within Redshift, all I said is just show me what, what's in Redshift, right? It's pretty yeah. straightforward. Select all from that table. Right? Mm. Straightforward SQL query. Now, this is the app flow uh, landing page. So you go click create flow and you enter a name, a flow name. So in this case, I'm going to call it app flow demo Salesforce to Redshift. And you can optionally enter a flow description that, that helps you keep track of what this flow is. Think about a time when you will have hundreds of flows. You want to know what you created. So you can add a description that's optional. And if you see below in the screen, that's where uh, you can choose either. Uh, these are the data encryption options, right? So you can either choose your custom encryption or you can just leave it unchecked. And we will, by default, use our own encryption key to encrypt your data. So I'm just uh, editing the, the description. And then the next step will be to more, right? So next step will be to select the source and the destination. So this is the data encryption. Next, yeah, next step is to choose source. So in this case, I'm going to choose Salesforce. So I chose Salesforce. Then you connect to Salesforce. It's pretty straightforward. You click create a new connection. You choose whether you're going to log into your production environment or sandbox, and you give it a name. So in this case, I'm going to call it my Salesforce account. Very creative. Uh, and click Continue just gives uh, ask Salesforce for permission to access, um, or for rather for AppFlow to access my Salesforce objects and records. Since it's going to be an event triggered flow, I'm going to click Salesforce events. Then I pick the event that I'm going to choose. So this is a contact object. So as soon as a new contact is created, I'm going to move that data from Salesforce into Redshift. So I chose the contact change event. Salesforce has two types of events, platform events, as well as change data capture events. So when you click on that drop down, it shows all the events. So I pick this event. Next step is to pick destination. Again, you see it's Redshift. It's all configured. So in the sense that as soon as I set up my Redshift, 
app flow can go in and figure out what Redshift tables I have access to. It shows the Redshift connections that are available. So I click on it and essentially pick my object. So in this case, it's the public object. And then I pick the specific Redshift table. So in this case, it's the customer contact table. So that's exactly the table that I had set up in Redshift. I'm just confirming it's that, yeah, the customer contact table. So that's the table I've picked. Now here are some error handling options. So sometimes what happens is when we are trying to insert it into the destination applications, there are times when this incompatibility in data, right? Data is not formatted right in the source system. So you're not able to insert. So there are always times when there are some records that are that you cannot insert. So we give you an option of specifying whether you want us to stop running the flow or whether you want us to ignore and continue the flow run. You can also optionally specify an S3 bucket from that drop-down list. So that way, any record we are not able to insert, we put it into that bucket and you can go and checkpoint from that point. In this case, the flow will run on event. So that's the option, the trigger option. But there are two other trigger options that are available, right? So the other two trigger options are triggering the flow on demand, which means as soon as I set up the flow, I go click a button and that will transfer the data right away. Or you can set up a schedule. So you can set up a schedule to specify when you want to move the data. It can be a weekly schedule. There's a little calendar that you can go and choose, and that will tell you when to schedule the flow, and you can move the data. And that sounds like a really common request, right? Like, think of all the number of times where you may say, like, okay, we can just batch our updates for our data set nightly, or we can batch them, you know, at this certain hour before a certain task has to be done. And you're basically enabling a fully automated cron job um with just selecting a little calendar date and a timer on it exactly now the the next step is to map the source fields into destination fields right so uh, you have fields in so salesforce and you have to tell us how to map those fields into redshift fields that you have already set up you have two options you can manually do it and that's what i'm going to show you but if you have a large number of fields you don't want to manually map one field at a time you can just create a csv file and upload it and we will automatically import that map, right? So in this case, I'm just gonna go and do the mapping manually. So that's the option I have chosen. Uh, I come in here and I start choosing the fields. Right? So the first field I choose is the account ID, and I'm going to map the account ID to the company name. I know I misspelled company, <laughs> so I'm gonna map that. The next field I'll pick is the title. So the title of the contact. So I'm gonna pick that and map it to the title field in Redshift. So you can see that it shows the fields that have not yet been mapped on the right-hand side. Then I choose email and then I map that to the email. The most important one is the name, right? You want the name of the contact. So <laughs> I pick the full name in Salesforce and map that into Redshift, into the name field. And that's it, I'm done with the mapping. I can add validations to make sure the records are not empty. I can add filters and then I'm done. I'm done with the flow. I go and create the flow. So it's pretty quick. You set up the flow in a few minutes and it's done. So you set up, uh, the flow is saved. Next step is to activate the flow. So an activated flow will go and monitor for the event to happen in Salesforce. So as soon as you activate the flow, we start going, we start looking under the hood, we start looking for the event to happen in Salesforce. So that's what's going to happen. So now I'm going to go into Salesforce and create a new contact. So go into, not Redshift, into Salesforce, yes. And you can see I've been playing around with it. So I'll create a new contact. And enter a name, my salutation. I pick a test count. I pick an email. I pick Jane as a vice president. So I say vice president. And then I pick an email. I, write, I type in an email. So I created a new contact. There are some fields which are mandatory. So I go create a new contact with those fields. These are the only fields I'm going to transfer, so that's all I'm populating. The rest of the fields will be ignored even if I created them here. So I go and save it, and that's it. So your new contact 
saved in Salesforce, it says contact Jane Doe was saved. And now you can see in app flow, if I refresh the screen, it says in progress. So it's already gone and picked up that event in Salesforce and it's processing data. So it's completed processing the data. Now the next step is to insert it into the destination that's in progress. And as soon as that's done, you will see a green banner that appears. There you go. So it shows that successfully transferred the data. Let's go into Redshift and see if the data is there. So I'm gonna run this query. And you will see the data right there. Moment of truth. <laughs> there you go. So you can see that it has transferred the data. There is the name, uh, the company. Of course, I mapped the account ID to the company name. Account ID is a string in Salesforce with some unique identifier. That's what got copied into the company name. Um, the title is vice president. The email came through. So yeah, so you have an integration. It's a near real-time integration. It took a few seconds to get the data from Salesforce and uh, deposit it into Redshift. But there you go. You have that integration. That is so cool. My my gears are already turning of all the, the interesting integrations that, that we can build with this. Right. Yeah, I mean, two one thing stuck out to me and one thing uh, was sort of the a big question on my end. The uh, thing that stuck out to me was that, you know, we got to spend all of our time in this entire data flow uh, working either on the recipient end, which in this case was where uh, Redshift, uh, and then we went on went to the source in Salesforce, and and we spent I don't know like almost all of our time in those specific services. Like the actual step of setting up this app flow uh, data flow was so minimal, and yeah. so like that small step is actually what people have been spending so much time writing custom connectors and integrations for. Right. And so that's really beyond the fact that you don't have to write any code to do this, and it, it's it's going to scale and it's performant and all of those benefits. Um, you know, it sort of begs the question. Like it works so well, you can just select from the drop down these different. Sources sources uh, and destinations, uh, you know, like what does the roadmap look like for other other sort of sources or integrations that, that we've been looking at? And I know uh, customer feedback is a large part of that, yeah. but, um, you know, any, anything yeah, you can share? Yeah, that's exactly how we work, right? So we talk to a lot of customers and we ask them, what applications do you want integrated much better with other applications as well as with your AWS services? And we work backwards from that. We have a roadmap of other connectors that we are building for very common applications that our customers have. So if you have a, an application that you very, of, very commonly use in your business, you will see that pop in in AppFlow sometime very soon. Awesome. That's and great to hear. The capabilities that we are adding in terms of what you can do with that data, right? Because there's a lot of value in adding transformations, the powerful transformations that we provide as part of that data transfer, right? So we are adding, enriching that capability over time because you don't want to bring a lot of data and then do some processing on it to extract a very small amount. You want to be able to do that while the data is in transit. And that's something that we do. So, so those are the capabilities that we will execute on uh, to serve our customers' requirements over time. Yeah, we've got some enthusiastic uh, shout outs in chat for the different integrations that folks are folks are wanting to see. One of which that's come up a bunch of times is Discord. Uh, obviously a very, we're here on Twitch, very cop popular uh, chat chat <clears throat> and voice application for, for gamers. Um, sure. But I know for just for community management, management broadly, I know a lot of uh, even software development communities that use Discord for managing their communities. So. I get the impression Evil Act 47 really likes Discord. <laughs> Well, uh, you know, so make it one other thing I was wondering, you know, who, can you talk about um, if there are any other large use cases, uh, you know, what, what customers are using AppFlow today and what are they doing with it and uh, what are the success stories? Yeah, so we've had customers move a large volume of data. So let me give you an anecdote here. So uh, when we launched a beta for the service, uh, this was a few months ago when we had a customer that signed up for the beta and they wanted to transfer a large volume of data in one shot, right? And that pretty much got us back to the whiteboard. We had to go back and say, well, there are these real use cases where customers want to keep, uh, want to bring in like millions of records from Salesforce into AWS to use in their analytics or machine learning uh, you know, models. And so we went back to the drawboard and uh, whiteboard and we saw 
how best can we enable these customers? And that's something that helped us scale this service, right? So we went back and looked at what APIs are available, what's the best way to make this a seamless, no code experience for our customers, yet uh, provide them the capability of being able to move that data. Before what we provided, what customers were doing was they were looking at their entire data set and breaking their job up into say 100 MB transfers or 50 MB transfers and setting up multiple jobs. It seems pretty straightforward, it's not because you don't know how your data is distributed. So it's, it's a trial and error process where you split up your workload into small ones. Sometimes it's within 100 MB, sometimes it's not. And so those fail, so they were spending hours just being just designing the system that can transport data. And with this new service, we've been able to uh, easily provide them a no code interface that within a few minutes, they're able to set up a process that can transfer that large volume of data from say different applications into AWS and vice versa. Awesome. Uh, I know we just spoke about, you know, now examples uh, of this in action and practice. I, we, we've told the audience that they can, they can voice their uh, desires for new integrations. Um, is there any place people can go to get the most up-to-date roadmap information? Now, I don't know if there's going to be a public roadmap, but even if just there's a source of information where they can see what we've released publicly for plans, is there anywhere where folks can go for that? Yeah, so we have our product page. Just search for uh, AppFlow, Amazon AppFlow, and we have a product page. We actually have an email there where you can send us your your request for integration. Um, of course, uh, if you are an AWS customer, talk to your representatives. Let us know what you what you think about the product, but also let us know which integrations are most valuable to you. We'll always work backwards from your requirements. Awesome, wonderful. Well, this is something that's you know super exciting for me. I, I think it's just like two huge value propositions tied together in one product. It's again a uh, force multiplier for anyone who's had to sort of handle this data siloing problem in the past that Rob spoke about. And then additionally, you know, this is really unlocking a set of capabilities for a lot of folks that that are reliant on this data and are sort of blocked or trapped by the barrier of entry of it being behind, you know, either APIs that they're not equipped to be able to access or other other sets of tools that, for lack of a better word, aren't really valuable for them just to get access to their data. So they, you know, they haven't been able to in the past. But uh, with AppFlow, you know, it, it seems to really have this two-sided value proposition that I know is going to help a lot of people. And I know a lot of people in chat have even said that they're excited to use this. And and, and all, shouting with all the integrations, I think, is a great testament to to how much value folks folks see uh, and being able to put this into their uh, into their workflows. Yeah, definitely exciting stuff. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for the demo. I mean, off the cuff, I mean, one piece of feedback I have is that you know it'd be cool to see kind of um, a table of you know you, I know you have the email in there to say like, hey, send your required requirements for custom integrations, but it'd be cool to know like, hey, um, we know everybody's been asking for this thing. It's on the roadmap. We're working on it versus we've never heard of that, right? Even that kind of, you know, um, uh, piece of information might be useful for people who are uh, taking early steps into the product. I know it would be a lot, a lot more encouraging if, you know, um, I was looking at a custom integration and I knew that I wasn't the only one and the team is already aware of it and is already working on it. Yeah. So we'll we'll keep our uh, so we'll keep giving previews and uh, you know early announcements for things that we can announce and yeah. uh, we'll provide opportunity for our customers to sign up for uh, for private betas or for a preview uh, coming forward. So we'll keep our customers informed and engaged because that's exactly how we build our services. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, one last thing, I just want to uh, basically reaffirm what you just said. Talk to your account managers if you're an AWS customer, right? Uh, because if there is a, one of these integrations that we're working on under the hood, there's a very strong chance we can try and get uh, working with you in, in some of the non-public releases earlier on in the process. Um, so let us know your concerns, let us know the integrations you want, and we can hopefully deliver that value sooner, uh, sooner than otherwise would be possible. So awesome. Venkatesh, thank you again for uh, joining us on the show today and, and walking us through AppFlow, a very exciting product, only two days old, uh, but we're glad to be able to get the, this information, demos, and, and all of these questions uh, from AWS developers uh, in front of you. So thank you again. Thank you for the opportunity. All right, awesome. Well, we will be right back. Uh, Rob and I have a few orders of business before we close out the show. Stick around. We'll be back in a few seconds. 
All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you go, Nick. Yeah, no, I don't know. It, it, I hit the button to move the scene, so it's it, I'm a, it's, it's almost like a Pavlovian response at this point. I hit the yeah. button, I say something. Um, yeah. But, all right, we're nearing the end of episode three here of AWS What's Next. Um, we have another episode coming up on May 15th, uh, starting at the same time. We're trying to shoot for the same day of the week, Fridays at noon Pacific time. Um, but quickly, because I know this has been almost two hours at this point, uh, let's recap everything that we covered. Again, what's next? We're covering the latest and greatest launches here from AWS, trying to get them uh, a little more visibility with regards to, you know, maybe blog posts aren't your favorite. Maybe there's uh, videos or another medium you prefer viewing these in. Uh, and so we're just trying to get add a little more depth, a little more flavor to some of the announcement that, announcements we know customers are very excited about. Yeah, absolutely. And just a quick recap of the, uh, the stuff that we went through. You know, we had the news section where we talked about GameLift Fleet IQ. We talked about chatbot general availability. We talked about infrastructure expansion to Africa uh, and adding a new AZ to central Canada. And then we talked about uh, TorchServe, which is a model server for PyTorch. Um, and then we had in-depth product demos for Deep Composer and AppFlow. Yeah, I, I know we try to make this show pretty generalizable with regards to the types of topics that we talk about. And uh, being at AWS, I think that's not too hard considering the, the, the very large breadth of services that we, we dabble in. But, you know, from the top down, we have a gaming compute launch, a uh, like a, uh, a DevOps chat ops service, a, uh, you know, network backbone launch or like uh, increasing regions. Um, Torch serve an AI ML infrastructure or a serving infrastructure launch. And that's actually entirely, it's, it's an open source project. Um, and then all of that before going into Deep Composer, which is this machine learning powered uh, software hardware one, two punch sort of thing where you can play music in the melody form onto the keyboard and have it synthesize music behind it. Uh, and then something very, very different from Deep Composer, we ended up talking about a service that just launched two days ago uh, and that was AppFlow. Yeah fresh out of the oven yeah now, now this is um now i, I think we, we're going to try and do a little bit of a uh, of a uh, ad lib here we're going to try to combine all these services into uh some semblance of a of a product or an integration that you might build or a feature that you might build and for this i think to make this fun we really need participation from twitch chat <laughs> so you're going to watch us struggle and i'm sure you can do better but we're going to try to struggle through this. And I want to see some, some suggestions to help us along in Twitch chat. So the, remember, the ask is that we're trying to take these six announcements. Remember, Game Lift Fleet IQ, Chatbot GA, Infrastructure Expansion, Torch Surf, Deep Composer, and AppFlow. And we're going to try to make some sort of you know, really, really rough architecture that integrates all of these different components. Rob, do you mind if I start? Because I've got a really good idea. OK, yes, off in the oven. OK, so hear me out. We're going to start with this being a game, right? Game with Fleet IQ, I think it, it sort of sets the stage here. Uh, it's got some sort of sessionized element to it. Uh, the topic of the game, not really too relevant, but there's some sort of chat involved, let's say. Um, so we have Game Lift Fleet IQ, uh, or, or Game Lift to sort of host our game servers, and Fleet IQ is going to be do a really great job at minimizing interruptions on spot instances. We can run it for such a low amount of money, we're just going to have so much development time to spend on other things. Um, thankfully, we're going to have a lot of peace of mind, though, right? Because, uh, you know, our company, we're running on Chime, we're running on Slack, whatever chat chat tool we have, we have the peace of mind and the agility to respond to any sort of outages that we could have because we were using Chatbot's new GA or, or Chatbot, which has now GA'd. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to kick it over to you. So we've got a game. We've got chat Chatbot uh, being used for, for the ops uh, folks on our team. Uh, where are we going from here? Thanks. Thanks. I, mean, you, I feel like you took the easiest part in there. You're like, let me just take it off the table and then and then hand it over to you. Okay. So let's roll with this. Okay. So you got you got chatbot. Uh, let's say um, when we have an interruption with Game with Fleet IQ, we are flipping the users over into a form where we add them to Salesforce. And when we get a user in Salesforce, we can add that to follow up with them. Um, because we basically shifted the data over into our data lake and we have a, um, you know, kind of a, a CRM pipeline that spans multiple different tools like this, right? And now basically said like, hey, you know, sorry, you had a bad experience. Your game server uh, was interrupted. Um, can we help you out with some free loot or something? All right, back over to you. 
Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Let's let's go. So, um, you know, we have that uh, ability to sort of consolidate and and sync our data from multiple sources there using AppFlow. And again, we don't need a team of fifty engineers here because AppFlow made that really simple. Um, now, another thing we could do is we could try to uh, use machine learning to try and predict for those folks that had a bad experience. We built a model. We want to serve it really quickly. We don't have a machine learning team of ten. We've got one person who made a model. Maybe it's an intern. I don't know. But now with TorchServe. They can easily deploy that and, and build maybe their own custom recommender for recommending a, a, a sale or a product to that user, or maybe recommending an item for us to give to them as reconciliation for uh, you know our server not working in a certain scenario or something. I don't know, whatever, like they had a bad time. We thank them for their feedback and, and we can give them a curated personalized gift using a model we trained using TorchServe. Um, we give them access to your SoundCloud where you've uploaded your Deep Composer <laughs> music. Okay, so you, you've got something good there. Uh, there is actually a talk <laughs> that I know someone is going to be giving at an event in the future on using Deep Composer to synthesize game, uh, game music, actually. So you mm. can upload a melody uh, for you know a certain theme or a certain area, and then you can synthesize the rest of the backing track to be used there. Another really exciting one that may be you know, less dynamic or less static, more dynamic, would be um, trying to change the ebb and flow of music that's like uh you know like as things are happening in real time where there aren't predefined arbitrary events you can have the the type of music that's being played or generated change uh based on all these other factors that you could feed into a, like a machine learning algorithm so let's that's let's call that one the, the, the tie-in for deep composer yeah yeah i'm, I'm satisfied with that <laughs> and I think then we had every single announcement uh well yeah i mean the 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 well, creme de la creme Creme yeah. de la creme would be the infrastructure expansion, right? It's yeah. uh, I know there are lots of game companies and there are lots of gamers on the world or in the world, and uh, they want those game servers as close to them as possible, right? They want that low latency, um, regardless of what genre, you know, whether you're a Fortnite player, whether you're a Counter Strike player, or so you, I'm not going to go and enumerate all of the you know infinitesimal number of games, but uh, having servers closer to home there in uh, you know, South Africa, New Cape Town region, very exciting. And the additional availability and durability from the third AZ over in Canada, um, just a clear net ad across the board there. Absolutely. We did it, I think. Uh, yes. that, that, that one's like a, a, like a wishy-washy yes, but I, I think we got it. <laughs> I, think, I think it passes the sniff test. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, well, that's, uh, I think that's a wrap. Uh, Lots of exciting announcements. And again, as Nick said, we're going to be back on May 15th for the next episode where we'll be covering more awesome announcements. You know, we're constantly releasing new features, uh, new services are going GA, and we're going to make sure that we highlight the, the most significant of those announcements for you um, every three weeks here. Yep, exactly. Three week cadence. We'll see you back here on May 15th. Two final things before we go. We'll have another link to the survey in chat. Please tell us what you like, what you'd like to see. If you'd like to see anything changed, first 100 folks to give a response, they're going to get $10 in AWS credit. Um, it's a very quick survey, I promise. And lastly, there are so many launches that we just simply don't have the time to get to. Unfortunately, uh, if Rob and I could, we'd stream for 24 straight hours and, and just keep this revolving door of, of guests coming in. Um, so we recovered a few. Uh, in our title, in our closeout credits, uh, I've compiled a list of all of the launches. Um, so hang tight uh, while you're watching the, sh the, the credits. Thank you again. Fill out the survey. And we will see you back again on May 15th. Thanks for tuning in, everybody.